All right. Today we will continue on uh, traffic studies. And as we mentioned before, we shall be discussing only two uh, uh, traffic studies, which are the most important traffic studies uh, for you as construction engineers. Uh, we discussed before, uh, you know, last lecture, the uh, uh, speed studies. Today we are going to discuss the volume studies. We're going to start with the volume studies. So, what are the volume studies? Basically, traffic counts. These, this is basically we are counting traffic, and that's one of the most basic traffic studies. Okay, that are the primary measure for, uh, of demand. Virtually all aspects of traffic engineering, you will need a traffic volume study. Okay. So, what volumes we are looking for? Okay. Uh, there are different ways of counting traffic. There is automated and there is manual counting techniques. And uh, we are trying to produce or to estimate the following. The volume, which is the number of vehicles or persons passing a point during a specified time of, uh, of, uh, of time period. Basically, it's one, you know, usually it's one hour, but sometimes we go to a daily volume or monthly volume, okay? Then we are looking for the rate of flow. Rate of flow, basically, is the rate at which vehicles or persons pass a point during a specified time uh, uh, period less than one hour. That means if we are counting flow rate, between you know for 20 minutes or for 15 minutes that's a flow rate demand what is demand demand basically is the number of vehicles or persons that desire to travel past a point we need to understand between volume demand and capacity the differences between volume and flow rate, you know rate of flow demand and capacity is clear Volume is the traffic that we observe on the road. Demand is the number of vehicles that are wishing to go through the road. Capacity, that's the maximum rate at which vehicles can traverse a point, okay? To give you a better example, you know, an example to, to better understand the concept, for example, here, if we have two, uh, two roads and these two roads are merging at this point, if the capacity for this cross section was 4,000 vehicles per hour, okay, the demand is uh, 3,800, then the volume that you, you can count here will be 3,800 because the demand is less than the capacity. Same here, if the capacity is 4,000, the demand is 3,600, the observed volume would be 3,600. So if we come here, the capacity, okay, is 6,000. Okay, that's the capacity. So the demand to go through here is basically the total demand from both approaches, which is 3,800 plus 3,600, that's 7,400. But the capacity here is just 6,000. So the volume that you is able to see here is like just 6,000. But the demand stay 7,400. So the result of this, because now the demand exceeding the capacity, we will start having queues in this point and takadus queues in this point because the capacity here is less or is, is lower than the traffic demand clear now what's the difference between uh, capacity volume and demand if we look here for example during peak hour, what happens? If the capacity, you know, mark it here with the, this dotted line, okay? Let me 
electricity is here. And that's the demand. The solid line here, that's uh, uh, the demand. Okay. This purple line, that's the demand. So what can we observe here is that at this point of time, the capacity or the demand exceeds the capacity. So this volume, where shall it go? It cannot pass this point. What happens in reality, if you are measuring the volume, the observed volume will be something different. We are all going to observe the demand and the capacity are going to be the same, like, you know, the demand will be like the volume, but here, that's what we are going to be observing. If you are doing, if you're having a traffic counter, it will get here to a plateau, okay, which will, will not exceed the capacity, but it will keep continuing here, then start dropping. Okay, so what's this area? This area is basically the volume that was stored in the system will start releasing after that point. You get the point? Okay. So that's, uh, you know, fundamentally to understand the difference between volume, uh, capacity, and demand. So, you know, usually when we are doing a traffic volume studies, we must be clear on this issue that you cannot put your traffic counters, okay, uh, at the point that you are measuring just the capacity. To give you an example, let me give you this example quickly. If we have an intersection, for example, that's an intersection. And this intersection is congested, okay? First of all, if you do counting here for the volume, what you are gonna get here is basically the capacity because it's congested already. You have queues building all over. So where shall you, you know, you put your counters, you put your counters here, far from this storage area. Here you get demand, okay? Clear, Ya Shabab? Clear, Doctor. Okay. So, We'll start with the first method, which is basically the traffic uh, uh, volume studies, cal manual counting. Manual counting, usually we have, there's the method of having a tally sheet. It's a, a sheet, okay? And you divide it into intervals, time intervals, and you start counting one car, second car, third car, fourth car, fifth car. These are the tally sheets. And when you go to the second time, you know, for example, this one from eight to eight fifteen, and this interval from eight fifteen to eight thirty. When you are done here, okay, of of course you are gonna put another uh, line for trucks or heavy vehicles, HV. This column will be for heavy vehicles. Okay. You count here if you have a heavy trucks and here four cars. Okay. Uh, after pass, you know, once you exit this time uh, interval, you go to the second interval and you start keep counting. Okay. As vehicles pass your point that you are counting at. You see my point? So that's the manual counting. After you finish, 
you go and, uh, uh, you know, hold a second. You, you go and just tally or, you know, sum these volumes and you are done with that. So that's the, the tally sheet or the manual counting using it. There is another approach, which is usually, you, you, it's still manual, but you are using, you know, mechanical counters. Okay. I think this is similar to Mesbaha, I think. Okay. And yes, we have Mesbaha like that. Yes. And there is this, you know, uh, these are, you know, for if you are count, counting volume by lane, okay, and this is usually uh, useful for uh, highways and stuff like that. And uh, sometimes they have this integrated sheet that you have four, you know, counters, and usually we use this for uh, traffic signals and intersections, okay, and that's still manual mechanical counters. Uh, there is another one which is basically electronic, okay, digital, but it's still, you know, manual. You have to press on the buttons here for different movements, okay? Then there is uh, automated counting. The automated counting, this is basically, uh, uh, you know, there are two types. There is the portable counters, okay? The portable counters are, uh, you know, you can move it from, you know, from one side to another side. And usually we keep it for a period of time. Uh, and usually you are using the pneumatic tube counters, okay? Like this one. That's the counter here. And there is a tube connected here. How does it work? It works on the pressure when the tires of vehicles pass over the tube, okay, it increases the pressure and there is a pressure sensor in the counter. So it counts, you know, that there is a vehicle passing and actually it counts the axial of the vehicles, okay. And it's good that you can differentiate, you know, you can use it to differentiate between <coughs> different vehicle classes. Okay, based on the, the number of axles uh, detected. And there's another type of automated counters, okay, which is basically the permanent counters. These permanent counters are built in the pavement itself. They make grooves in the pavement and they put metallic, co you know, uh, copper coils in these uh, uh, grooves and we call it loop detectors. Okay, it works on the, the concept of magnetic induction. That's when a metallic mass passes uh, in front of uh, a coil. Okay, it generates a, a you know, a electric uh, pulse. And this pulse is converted into a traffic uh, vehicle that was counted. So that's a similar, that's an example for the permanent counters. These are loop detectors placed into embedded into the pavement. And we can see here that they have two loop detectors, you know, consecutive to each other. And here, for example, we use it for counting volume and also measuring speed. Okay. And all connected to a unit here, electronic unit. And this unit upload every period of time the observed data to a traffic management center. That's the structure of the loop detectors, inductive loop detector. These are similar to the loop detectors that you can find on uh, the gates, okay, entry gates. So this is similar to it. And there's the last, uh, you know, uh, uh, category of automated counting, which is basically a video imaging based. Back to the automated, automated counting. Okay. There's the permanent counters and the permanent counters. These are stationary. These are uh, placed on 
specific locations on the highway. And it's, uh, you know, these are the ones that we use to, uh, uh, you know, to come up with or to calculate or to count the average daily traffic volumes, okay? And usually these are, you know, taking this shape. As you can see, we have here loop detectors. And you can see in each lane, there are two loops. And basically, we take advantage of this and counting not just the volume, but counting the speed also of the traffic, okay? The structure of these loop detectors is basically, uh, uh, we, we, we build a groove in the pavement, okay? Then we have this uh, uh, copper coil, okay? That is placed into the pavement. Then it is covered on top here, okay? To protect it from weather, from uh, water and stuff. Then there is a, 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 a cable wire that goes to the, uh, you know, microcontroller that collects these data, okay? The, the third category, which is now trendy and, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking advantage of the new advances in artificial intel uh, intelligence and in image, uh, in machine vision, is basically the video-based imaging, okay? Which is basically, we use it now for a tra at, uh, traffic signals and stuff like that. Basically, the camera, that's a scene from a camera, and in the system, we define virtual loops. We don't, we don't have to go through the pavement and build inductive loops, okay? And these loops, once there is a change in the image, for example, here the loop is clear. There is no change because, you know, that's a pavement. But when there is a change like what we see here, it detects that there is a car, okay? So that's the, you know, it's actually, it's not, it's more than this, but that's a very simple, you know, explanation for how it works. Any questions so far? Okay. By this, we conclude the, the, the part for traffic studies, and we move to the, the last part of this module, which is basically capacity analysis and level of service. Okay. We're going to start first by explaining the concept of capacity and level of service, then we will apply these uh, methods on uh, estimating the level of service for a multi-lane highway. Okay, first of all, just to have a background, okay, the Highway Capacity Manual first was published by the, what we call, what was called then Bureau of Public Roads. Now it's called Transportation Research Board, and that was in the 1950s. The second edition was in, uh, in uh, uh, 1965, okay, which is 56 years ago, okay. Then the third edition was in 1985, 20 years later. Then we had the 2000, and now we have the 2010. Uh, however, we, I prefer to use the 2000, for most part, because it's metric edition, okay? So it's very, it's easier for us to deal with or to use it. And there is a highway capacity manual for 2010. It includes uh, new chapters that was not included before. It has maybe, I think, three or four chapters regarding the roundabouts, pedestrians, bicycles, and stuff like that. <clears throat> so what are the primary objective for the highway capacity manual. The primary objective for the highway capacity manual was to provide uniform guidelines for the nation's rapidly growing highway construction program. After the World War, after World War I, World War II, okay, uh, you know, they started the project to build a, a national highway network. They, it was called in the US, the interstate. These are, uh, highways, uh, uninterrupted freeways, okay, that connects east to west, north to south. So that's a grid of uh, 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 freeways, uh, and it was built originally for 
defense and uh, for defense strategy that you can access any uh, boundary point on the US using this network. Uh, the second objective is basically to assure efficiency and equity among transportation infrastructure users in the states. Okay, so basically to assure, you know, to make sure that the, the federal funds supporting uh, uh, the development or improvements of transportation is uh, uh, efficiently distributed to different states. Okay, first of all, <clears throat> what is capacity? What is the definition of capacity? The Highway Capacity Manual defines capacity as the following. It says that the capacity of a facility is the maximum hourly rate at which persons or vehicles. See with me, it says that the maximum hourly rate. So that's the first part. That's one. Which persons or vehicles? That means we can calculate capacity for persons or vehicles. Reasonably can be expected to traverse a point or a uniform section. So we can measure capacity at a point or a uniform section. Okay. So that's concept here, that's concept number two. Here, concept number three. Of a lane or roadway during a given time period, if a given time period, okay, under prevailing roadway traffic and control conditions. Okay, so it's at, at a specified time, a specific time, under prevailing roadway and control. And here there is an important reasonably can be expected. That means it is repeatable. Okay, it's not one one time event. Okay, that for example, you record a, a maximum flow one day, maybe 3000 vehicles per, per hour. Then you never achieve this, uh, this number, then the capacity of this highway is not 3000. It's the number that is, you know, uh, repeat, gets repeated frequently. So these are the five principles, okay, in the capacity definition for the highway capacity man. Again, capacity of a facility is the maximum hourly rate at which persons or vehicles reasonably can be expected to traverse a point or a uniform section of a lane or roadway during a given time period under prevailing roadway traffic and control conditions. Okay, that means, for example, if you are measuring capacity for an approach, okay, at an intersection, it depends on the signal timing. So it depends on the, you know, control conditions. Okay, maybe the capacity is low, but if you increase the green time, for that approach, the capacity improves. <coughs> Any questions? Here we are, you know, splitting these concepts. So the con the first concept, capacity is defined as the maximum hourly rate. Here, maximum hourly rate. Uh, concept number two can be expressed in terms of, you know, persons or vehicles. Concept number three, capacity is defined for prevailing, you know, roadway traffic and control conditions. Then capacity is defined at a point or uniform section uh, segment, uniform section of the facility. And the, the last one, the maximum, this maximum flow rate can reasonably be expected to be reasonably means, okay, a, 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 rather it's, it's a value that represents the flow level that can be reasonably achieved repeatedly. It's not one time shot. Okay, 
So these are the five principle, principles in defining the capacity according to the HCM. There is another concept, which is basically level of service. Okay, Mustawa al Khidma. Level of service, it was introduced in 1965, okay, as a convenient way to describe the general quality of operations on a facility. Okay, uh, it uses a, a letter scale from A to F. And everybody knows what's A and what's F. If you, you know, if we say that the level of service is A, Okay, that's good. If we say it's F, that means it's failing, it's bad. Okay. So why it was introduced? It was introduced as a means of, com of communicating. You know, you cannot, you know, for example, if you are, if you're having a public hearing, okay, or uh, handing, uh, you know, your analysis results to someone, a politician that is not specialized in that field. How can you tell them that, you know, the situation or the traffic condition is bad? You tell them, oh, the delay is average, blah, blah, blah. The average volume, per, you know, per lane. They don't understand this. Okay. It's difficult for them to comprehend what you are saying. But if you say that the condition for this highway is A or B or C, they can understand this. They can say, okay, A, that means it's good. So they need something to describe the condition of the facility, okay? Especially for those are, that are not specialized in your field. So the definition of level of service according to the Highway Capacity Manual, it's a quality measure. It says here, level of service is a quality measure describing operational conditions within traffic stream generally in terms of such service measures as speed and travel time, freedom to maneuver and traffic interrupt uh, interruptions and comfort and convenience. That's a very important part. Say so here, generally in terms, in terms of such service measure as speed, travel time, freedom to maneuver, traffic interruptions, comfort and convenience. What do we mean with this? Okay, basically level of service is a quality measure. It's a measure for quality. It describes the quality, okay, for uh, operational conditions of this uh, facility. يعني هو مقياس جودة تمام جودة التشغيل لمرفق معين أو لشيء معين في الترافيك سيستم أوكي أوكي generally in terms of such service measures في مقاييس للخدمة تمام مقياس الخدمة بيختلف من facility to another facility for example speed could be a service measure travel time freedom to maneuver أوكي حرية المناورة في الطريق تمام uh, traffic interruptions and so on تمام؟ We will go to this later with, with more examples. Any questions? Okay. There are some critical issues with the level of service concepts. As I mentioned before, it's a letter-based uh, grading system. Okay? So uh, it's a step function. Okay? So the problem here is that we have if we have site one, site two, and site three. Site one and site two are equal because they are level of service B. Site three is C. However, site two is almost identical and can relate to site three, but this one is C, this one is B. Also, site one is significantly better than Site two, but still B. So that's one of the deficiencies of this letter system. Okay, so that's one. Level of service are basically step functions, each representing. A, so that's basically what we are saying here in this slide. 
Uh, another critical concept, okay, is that level of service is to be defined in terms of parameters that can be perceived by drivers and passengers, okay, and that uh, the, def the definition should reflect that perception, okay? That means it, it's, it's uh, the measure of service, okay, is based on the parameters perceived by the drivers, okay? So here, most level of service criteria are based on the collective judgment of professionals exercised through the highway capacity and the quality of service committee. Okay, so you need to have some public opinion into this. The common service measures used in level of service is basically speed, travel time, and delay freedom to maneuver okay which is basically traffic density when you have a dense flow okay you cannot switch lanes easily okay so your freedom to maneuver is limited traffic interruptions okay comfort and convenience to have an example on this for example here if we are talking about uh, type of flow, uninterrupted flow. So for freeways, okay, basic section, density defines the level of service. The denser the flow, okay, the poorer the level of service. Uh, weaving, weaving segments, also measured by density. Ramp junctions, measured by density. Multi-lane highway, measured by density. Two-lane highways. This is different. What we mean with two, me, uh, two lanes, it's two lanes, two direction. That means lane in this direction and another lane in the other direction. Here, the measure for, or the service measure is based on average travel speed and the percentage of time spent following another car. Okay, so here that's another service measure. For interrupted flow, Okay, at signalized intersection, for example, okay, the measure for level of service is the delay. As the delay time increase at the intersection, the level of service decrease. For unsignalized intersections, that's a stop sign, controlled intersection, again, it's controlled delay. For urban streets, that's the average travel speed. For transit, that's for buses and bus service, Okay, the service frequency, service headway, passengers per seat, and so on. For pedestrians, space. Okay, for bicycles, frequency of conflict, conflicting events. So that's, so these are examples for different measures of effectiveness. This is important to know. Okay, level of service and service flow rate concepts. Okay, uh, the service flow rate concept is basically the maximum volume at a certain level of service. Okay, that can be achieved, and we use it for planning purposes. Okay, we will take a break here for five minutes and we'll be back at 11. Any questions so far? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, we will continue here with uh, uh, problems of level of service. Okay. Uh, there is one, you know, some key problems with the, with the level of service concept or the level of service criteria. First of all, it's a single set of level of service criteria. That means if we go back here, to, you know, for example, signalized intersection and control delay. Someone living in a big city, for example, like in New York, okay, they are used to long, you know, queues. They are used to congestion. They are used to delay, okay, 
So their perception for delay is different than someone living in a remote city in Montana, for example. We have a single set. That means if the delay is more than five minutes, okay, or five seconds, then that's, you know, that's level of service B. If the delay is more than 25 uh, seconds, that's C. And this is applied for everybody. So as I mentioned, different level of perception, okay, and single set of criteria. So that's one of the deficiencies of the level of service concept. Also, some state and local governments have incorporated level of service criteria into development. Yes, this happened in the states that some uh, governments, local governments, okay, started to put the values that stated by the Highway Capacity Manual as, uh, as standards. But the problem is that the Highway Capacity Manual itself is dynamic and it's moving, it's changing. So that's another issue. Uh, so that's basically the, the primary, uh, you know, issues with this. There is another issue which is basically at signalized intersection, okay? And at signalized intersection, uh, they started to incorporate another concept which is basically volume to capacity ratio. In other words, if the level of service is F at signal at traffic signals, is it because the volume exceeding the demand or the traffic control timing or the signal timing is bad? That means if we redesign the signal timing, we might end up with a better, you know, level of service. So that's uh, the other concept, which is basically the volume to capacity ratio. So here, Okay, we are measuring the value between volume and capacity. Okay, uh, it's defined as the ratio between current proje or projected traffic demand flow to the capacity of the facility. This ratio is used as a measure of capacity sufficiency for existing or proposed facilities. For example, is the demand volume regard you know relative to capacity is higher. If the demand is higher than the capacity at a signal, there is not much that you can do to improve the level of service, okay? Because at this point, we call it oversaturated. Any questions? Okay. Now we are gonna start to apply level of service and calculate level of service for multi-lane highway. Some of you might be wondering why we are studying this. Okay, and I will tell you, some of you might say, okay, we are construction engineers, why we are studying this? I'll tell you, no, you need to study this. Simply, if you are building a bridge, okay, over uh, a highway, you need to prove to the authorities, okay, or to the municipalities, that your scaffolds, that your, that your forms and scaffold and the construction site will not affect the level of service on that road, okay? If you are doing a resurfacing for pavement, okay? You know what's resurfacing? In highways, okay, when there's a lot of cracks on the surface layer, okay? We do resurfacing, that we remove that uh, surface layer and put a new uh, layer. Okay, so that's one of the tasks for you as a transportation, as a, as, a, as a construction engineer that you might be involved with, okay? You try to, you know, to optimize it such that you do it in, in, a, in an efficient way and without affecting the traffic flow. So let's go back to our topic. Here, the Highway Capacity Manual describes the level of service at highway facility uh, you know, level of service A represent describe operations at or above the posted speed limit. That means the traffic speed is at the speed limit or above it slightly. And the vehicles are almost completely, you know, unimpeded in their ability to maneuver. Unimpeded in their ability to maneuver. That means you are driving on the highway and you you have the freedom to switch lanes easily there is no traffic around you that prevents you from doing so 
when we go to level of service B, okay, level of service B is still the speed almost at the speed limit or slightly above it, okay? Uh, but there is slightly restricted your maneuver, your, your switching, your maneuver within the traffic stream, okay, is slightly, is only slightly restricted, okay? But in level of service C, your speed is near, at or near the speed limit. So now there is some reduction in the speed and the freedom to maneuver within the traffic, okay, is not severely restricted. Okay, level of service D, okay, the, the maneuverability is more not severely limited. Okay, and the driver experiences reduced physical and psychological comfort. Okay, that means here the density is higher. Number of vehicles per lane, per kilometers is higher here. Here, you are almost driving alone on the road. Here you have few cars more. And here you are, you see the density, as the density increase, the level of service decrease. We go to level of service E. Here, your maneuverability. Okay, okay, first of all, vehicles are closely spaced. And maneuverability within the traffic stream is extremely limited. You can relate to this if you drive on King Fahd uh, 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 Highway uh, during the morning peak hour. It's very hard to switch lanes, right? Most probably the, the freeway is acting, you know, is operating at E or D. Level of service F, that's when there's a, you know, uh, 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 the, the flow condition starts getting into stop and go, okay? And that's a breakdown in the flow. Breakdown in vehicular flow. Such conditions generally exist when the number of vehicles arriving at a freeway section is greater than the number of vehicles that can move through it, okay? That's when we start to having stop and go. Any questions? Okay, the H2 defines two main elements. Okay, when we are talking about cross-sectional elements of the highway, there is the roadway and there is the travelway. The roadway is the portion of the highway, including shoulders for vehicular use. A divided highway has two or more roadways. The travelway, this is the portion of roadway for the movement of vehicles. To have a better understanding, Okay, that's a roadway. Okay, the pavement here from here to here, that's the travel way. But all together, that's a roadway. And that's a typical cross section. Okay. We have a travel way and we have shoulders on the right and the left. Okay. Uh, sometimes, Sometimes we have two roadways and there's a, a divider in the middle, okay? And sometimes they are merged, you know, pavement slope in, in one way and, you know, there's, you know, the, the shoulders are linked together here. Okay, what is the highway capacity, okay? The highway capacity standard condition that we have lanes 3.6 uh, meters, minimum lane width, Okay, these are the base condition. And we have only passenger cars on the, uh, on the traffic stream, but in reality, we have passenger cars and trucks. Okay, in reality, we might have lane width that is not 3.6. So that means there is, you know, adjustment factor for lane width. Here, passenger cars, uh, in, the in the traffic stream. That means our volume, we need to convert it to passenger car per hour, per lane, okay? No direct access, there is no access point. 
So here we need to have a factor to adjust for access point. A divided highway, that means we have island or median. So if we don't have, then we need to have factor for median. Free flow speed higher than 100 kilometers per hour. That's one standard condition. And 3.6 meters minimum total lateral clearance in the direction of travel. Okay. This represents the total lateral clearance from the edge of the traveled lanes to uh, obstructions along the, the edge of the road. To give you an understanding for this condition, that means if we have, uh, that's a shoulder, that's the travel way, and that's, and that's is one, just one direction. And we have here trees, okay. So there is a clearance on the left and there is clearance uh, on the right. The total lateral clearance, total lateral clearance equal the lateral clearance on the left plus the lateral clearance on the right. That's the total lateral clearance, total lateral clearance here. Okay, that's for a, a, a multi-lane highway that are separated with a median or something, okay? And remember, the maximum for the left lateral clearance and the, the, the right lateral clearance should be not more than 1.8. That means if we have here three and we have here one, then the total lateral clearance will be how much? What is the left? One meter. What's the right? Three meter. So one plus three, no, we put one eight. So the total lateral clearance is 2.8 meters. That means the three, we slash it and we put 1.8 meters. Okay. Despite the fact that in reality it's three meters, but what we count, we take into account here is just a 1.8. So that's one important issue. Clear? Okay. Then we do this adjustment for the free flow speed. The free flow speed will be adjusted from the basic free flow speed. We subtract an adjustment factor for lane width. If the lane width is, you know, less than uh, 3.6, according to the table here. And just to give you an idea for these tables, I have prepared selected uh, collect, you know, select a collection for uh, these factors. <coughs> Hold on with me. <coughs> so these are uh, just a collection of tables. Okay, from the highway capacity manual for multi-lane highway facility. And that's, you know, uh, the level of service curve. Here, these are the adjustments curves for, you know, that's the adjustment for lateral clearance. That's the adjustment for lane width. Okay, so if the lane width is 3.6, that's a standard, the adjustment is zero. If the lane width is three, then there is a reduction factor 10.6 kilometer per hour. Clear, yeah, Shabab. So this factor, we get it from that table, which is here. That's 21.4 dash four. Okay. For the lateral clearance, Okay, again, the lateral clear adjustment for lateral clearance, okay, a, a table or exhibit 21-5, which is here, 21-5, you go for, if we have a four lane highway and the total lateral clearance was maybe, for example, three, if it's 3.6, then the adjustment factor is zero. 
if it's less than that, okay, then these are the values. If you have six lane highway, okay, then you take this these columns. Any questions so far? For the median, okay, the median, there is adjustment factor for the median. Undivided highway, that means there is no median, then it's 2.6. For divided highway, including uh, highways that has, you know, uh, turning uh, left, uh, you know, uh, lane, okay, it's zero. That means if it's, if it's divided, then this factor is zero. If it's undivided, it's 2.6. For access points, what do we mean with access points? These are driveways, you know, you know, that's the freeway and these access points. Okay, driveways and so and, and things like that, because basically it slows the traffic. So the adjustment factor for the access point also is shown here. So these are the access point. Okay, density adjustment. Okay, so if you have six access points per kilometers, you reduce four kilometers per hour from the free flow speed. Clear, Shabab? Clear, Doctor. Good. So, once we estimate the free flow speed, then we go to, you know, converting the volume into, you know, passenger cars. How we do that? We have the total volume here, divided by the peak hour factor, divided by the number of lanes, divided by the uh, adjustment factor for heavy vehicles, Okay, and divided by FP. What are these factors? Okay, VV are the, basically the 15 minutes passenger car equivalent flow rate, passenger car per hour per lane. The V, that's the hourly volume observed. PHF, that's a big hour factor that we calculated before. N, that's number of lanes in that direction. Okay, that means if we have a freeway that is four lane. Means we have two lanes in each direction, two in this way and two here. So N equal two, clear? A heavy vehicles adjustment factor, that's a factor that convert all uh, uh, vehicles into passenger car. And here, FB, that's a driver population factor. What is the driver population factor? That's an adjustment factor, okay, that we put for uh, the driver's population, especially in the areas where we have tourists and uh, drivers that are unfamiliar with the network. So those unfamiliar, they are looking for, you know, addresses. They are looking for, you know, they are not commuters, okay? And usually we put one for this factor, unless you have conducted a study and survey to assess the value. The, va the minimum value for this one, I think 0.85. And there should be a study before implementing or, you know, using this number, these values. Then after that, we have, this is the, the average passenger car speed. That's the adjusted free flow speed. And we have the passenger car volume, the VP. So if we have the VVB here, and say, for example, we have uh, the volume, for example, or the free flow speed was 95, for example. So basically, we go this way. And we go so that's a point of intersection. So the level of service in this case will be C. Okay, that's a graphical method. And there is another way to do it, which is basically if we, you know, especially if the, the volume is less than F 
VB less than 1400 passenger car per hour per lane, then the speed equal the free flow speed. Then we calculate the density will equal how much? VB divided by S. However, if the volume is greater than uh, 1400, we enter this area, which is nonlinear. At this point, we have to adjust for the, uh, uh, to, to get the speed. How we can do that? Here are the uh, uh, equations for this. For volume greater than 1400, okay, we substitute in this to get the speed, the adjusted speed, okay? Any questions? Okay. Let's have an example. Okay. Now, uh, usually when we conduct this capacity analysis and level of service, okay, we have several scenarios. We can apply it for operational case. Okay. In the operational case, we have existing facility. And what's the input? The input is basically number of lanes, okay, lane width, median, shoulders, traffic volumes, the topography, okay, uh, terrain level, rolling mountains, and so on, okay. We have a, a HV percent, percentage of heavy vehicles, and a percentage of, uh, and the peak hour factor. The design objectives, okay, current level of uh, service. So that's the objective of the analysis, the input here, and the objective is to come up with the level of service. Then here uh, we have design input, design volume, target level of service. If that's for a new construction, remember here, this is new construction. The, the design input is basically the design volume, the target level of service, the topography and the right of way. The design objective basically is the number of lanes. We need to know how many lanes we need, the lane width, the median and shoulders. There is another uh, case for the design case, which is the new construction also. number The design input number of lanes, uh, lane widths, median shoulders and the projected, uh, you know, uh, heavy vehicle percentage and peak hour factor and the design objective to come up with to estimate the maximum you know service volume the maximum load or the maximum traffic volume that this highway can uh, take that's clear okay let's have an example and let's try to uh, estimate the level of service for that uh, case Hold on with me for a while, please. Let me just explain here a few issues because we did not, uh, in this form, in these tables, and we're gonna send you these tables, uh, inshallah, after the class, and uh, these tables includes, you need to print it and, you know, bring it with you during the exams because it has the, the, all the tables that you will need in the course. Uh, here, for example, this is a design sheet, you know, uh, from the highway capacity manual. Let me just adjust it for you. Okay, rotate view. This is the multi-lane highway worksheet, okay? And all the equations and things that you need, you will find it here, okay? It say, if the application is operational, the input is free flow speed, N number of lanes, VP, the output will be level of service and the speed and the density. If the application is design, okay, this is the input, this is the output, okay? And it gives you a small miniature you know, a shape for the, 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 the flow and the speed, average passenger car speed for level of service, okay? And here, 
you fill in your information, your name, your agency, or your company name, and another period, and also the site information. Then you identify whether this is operational design, a design for N or design for V that you want to you know estimate the service volume or estimate the number of lanes needed. Here that's planning. Uh, level of service, planning, number of planes, and so on. Here's the input. You define the input, the volume, okay? The annual average daily volume, okay? If you are designing, then we are gonna use the average annual daily traffic volume, tamam? The peak hour factor, the K, the D, then you have the DD, the directional design hourly volume, okay? We calculated here. Also the input, the peak hour factor, the percentage of trucks and buses, the percentage of RVs, and description for the terrain, whether it's level or rolling or mountainous, okay? And if, if there's a grade, you write the grade here and the length in kilometers and up or down. And the number of lanes, N. Then, to calculate the flow adjustment, you have the factor P that I mentioned before. You have to estimate the equivalent truck, ET, the ER, then that's the factor for adjusting the FHV, the adjustment factor for heavy vehicles. It's you know estimated using this equation, where it's one divided by one plus percentage of trucks multiplied by the equivalent of truck minus one plus percentage of RVs multiplied by the equivalent of RV minus one. Then we go to the speed inputs, okay? The, so they have your, you have the lane width here, and the, uh, you know you come up fair, you know finally here with the adjusted uh, uh, free flow speed, okay? Then here we come to the final you know calculation. The operation if it's operational and planning, so you okay you, you are doing a level you are doing level of service, okay? Or design planning you have to estimate the maximum volume. So that's, this is part, this part is for operation level of service or, or planning level of service. Here for design, okay, you are looking for the maximum service volume here. So you just substitute and follow the steps. And here it gives you the factor location for each of these factors here, and also the glossary and definition of the terms, N number of lanes, V volume, hourly volume, and so on. So everything is contained in this uh, form, okay? Any questions? Okay, I'm gonna start now solving uh, 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 an example <coughs> with you. Capacity <coughs> analysis and level of service. We have a problem here. It says that for a given highway cross section data, we have a cross section data, number of lanes, four, two lanes in each direction, lane width. You see the problem with me? Yes, we can see it. Yes, doctor. Okay. Lane width is 3.2, no median. These are the information that we have. The speed limits is 85 kilometers per hour, okay? Uh, access points, we have eight access points per kilometers. The current flow rate is 1,410 vehicles per hour. The terrain level is uh, uh, its level. The, the, what's, est what's the first, the requirements here is to estimate the current level of service, okay? So let's solve this problem. And let me just take this here. And let's go to let's open a whiteboard. Okay. 
So let's share this. So that's a problem here on the whiteboard. Okay. And what we have here, we have N. Okay. We have N here. Let me just adjust the tone of the, of the pen. Okay. N equal how much? Two. And we have lane width 3.2, that's less than 3.6, correct? That means we need to have adjustment factor for lane width. Okay, so let's come up with, you know, with these factors and see. Okay, let me just adjust the orientation. Okay, here. What was the lane width? 3.2. So we have adjustment factor 5.6. So basically, uh, the free flow speed, free flow speed equal the basic uh, free flow speed minus the adjustment factor for lane width minus adjustment factor for lateral clearance minus adjustment factor for median minus adjustment factor for access point okay so the free flow speed adjusted will be the basic free flow speed is 85 so that's 85 minus lane width adjustment factor how much is we found it here it was here uh, 3.2, 5.6. So this one equal 5.6. There is no median and the shoulder is 1.2. Okay. What does this mean? In case of no median, we assume the left, you know, lateral clearance 1.8. So the total lateral clearance equal. 1.8 plus 1.2 so equals 3.0 so that's the total letter clearance so what is the adjustment factor for letter clearance here it's less than 3.6 so we go back to the table and the total letter clearance is how much three so it's 0 0.6 minus 0 0.6 minus 0.6 and the, the unit here is kilometers per hour kilometers per hour okay so what else we need we have f median so here it says no median so that means f median equals let's go to here Undivided highway, that means no median, it's minus 2.6. So it's minus 2.6. So let's substitute here. So we have here minus 5.6, minus 0.6, minus 2.6, minus for access point. How many access points we have? We have here eight access points so let's go back and see for access points zero it's zero for six it's point four it's four for 12 it's uh, eight please notice with me that the the reduction factor in the free flow speed due to access point is a linear function because here the access point doubled and the reduction factor is doubled so we can say that 
in our case, the factor for the axis point will equal how much? 8 multiply 4 by 6. Correct? So we have here 20, we have 32 by 6. So that means it's 5 point, how much? Point uh, three 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 five point three three equals. So the the adjusted speed will be eighty five minus five point six minus point six minus two point six minus five point three three equals seventy point. Eight seven kilometers per hour. Correct. So now we are done with the free flow speed. Now we want to estimate the or adjust this volume to get the VP. VP equals the volume divided by the peak hour factor multiplied with N, multiplied with F H V, multiplied with F P. Now, do we have any information out about the driver population? No, didn't say anything. So we assume that this one is one. N is two. We know this from here. Okay, big hour factor. It's here. So we know this 0.9. So what do we need to calculate? We need to calculate the factor for a heavy vehicle. So the factor for heavy vehicle equals 1 divided by 1 plus percentage of trucks multiply by equivalent truck minus 1 plus percentage of RV multiplied with E R minus one. Okay. So how many trucks do we have and how many RVs we have? So one plus, what is the percentage of trucks over here? Okay. Did it say anything here about trucks? No. No. We have zero trucks. Okay. Did it say anything about uh, about uh, RVs? No. So we have zero. So this factor is one. So that means we have here volume. Volume is fourteen hundred and ten divided by peak hour factor point nine. Multiply by two, multiply by one, multiply by one equals seven at three point three. Yes, thank you. So this one is seven eight three point three, and the units here should be passenger car per hour per. As we can see, the volume here is below 1400. Okay, so it's, it's still in the linear uh, part. So we can say that VB is less than 1400. That means it's 1400 passenger car per hour per lane. That means that uh, the speed equal the adjusted free flow speed equals uh, 70.87 kilometers per hour. Then the density equal the VP divided by the speed. So it equals 783.3 divided by 70.87 equals 
So this one is 11 point O five, okay, passenger car, bear, kilometers, bear, lane, because it's density, okay? So what does this mean? This means that we have, I'm sorry, let me just put this one back where it is. This means that we have level, of service equal. Let's go back and see what level of service we got here. Okay. So what level of service we have here? We have, you know, how much density we had? 11.05. So that's, you know, almost a borderline, you know, B. So it's right, right, right here in this area. You see my point? So it's basically B slash C, but it's more C. And that's actually one of the critical issues. It's just only 0.05 that turned the whole thing into C. So you can say it's B over C or C in, in between. Doctor, please, could you go back for the graph or the yes. diagram to see how to figure the B or C? Okay. Now, the density, the threshold for B is 11 passenger car per kilometer per lane. Okay? That's okay. the value. Okay? And we here we calculated the value, Aslan. Here we, we, didn't, we, we did not solve it graphically. So we calculated the value. Yes. Okay, so as you can see, it's 11.05. So it's almost 11. Yes. So that's a boundary line. It's between the B and C. Okay. Okay. Clear? Thank you. Good. Yes, clear. You're welcome. Any questions so far? Okay. Then I'm just, just bear with me. Do you have any class after this one or we can just have a, a let's add here our problem you know for example that we have uh, terrain and let's assume that we have heavy vehicle percentage okay equal 18 uh, percent how the situation will be if we have heavy vehicles, 18%, okay? Then these factors will change. We will not have here any more zeros, okay? Uh, just calculate this one and see if there is, okay, uh, so the percentage trucks in this case will be 0.18 multiply. What is the equivalent truck in this case? We have the, the terrain type is level. The terrain type is level. So we go back to this table. Okay. So the E truck, the equivalent to the truck is 1.5 passenger cars in case if it's level. RVs, it's 1.2. So in case of level terrain, okay, the equivalent for truck is 1.5 passenger car. So this would be 1.5 minus one plus zero because there is no RVs. In this case, this will not be one anymore. Okay, in this case, this factor will be one divided by 0.18, one divided by one plus 0.18 multiply 0.5. So it's 0.9, 
one seven and it will change the whole calculation again we're going to stop here and we're going to just take a quick